Working Nation is about the future of work, and it is important to know what the skills are for the future of jobs, um, as well as where the jobs are going to be, because it's changing. They're estimating 47% of jobs are in danger of being lost in the next 20 years because of technology, and it's not just manufacturing. So I'm looking forward to having a conversation with the folks here, hearing all of their ideas. Um, you can visit us at workingnation.com and uh, tweet about this event. But thank you guys so much for having us, and we're looking forward to the discussion. Fantastic, thanks. Yeah. So we're going to have a couple of different phases tonight. Uh, we're going to start off with a little bit of a panel discussion, and everyone on the stage has an interesting perspective to offer about this broad title of the future of work and media. And uh, my background is in uh, debate, and so I'm a big fan of kind of getting into particulars. So we're going to start by asking each of the panelists to go down, talk a little bit about what they've seen as the biggest transition in this space of media and jobs in the last few years, and then talk a little bit about what they in their job and their role experience in that. So a little bit of what the change you've seen recently and how you've kind of come to this piece of it. Now I realize I wish I didn't sit right next to you. <laughs> um, should we choose ourselves also? Absolutely. Uh, hi, everybody. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here tonight and see such a full room for this conversation. My name is Suzanne Alcantara, and I'm the director of Annenberg's Career Development Office uh, and curated our panel tonight based on sort of this question that Gordon asked. So I have been in Annenberg for 16 years, four years as the director of career services. And in the last three years, every fall, I think you all received this and hopefully replied, we do a survey. We ask students, what are the top em three employers you'd like to work for? And we use that to inform our employer outreach. And that has given us great data. So we then curate a list of the top 30 companies. And all of our panelists here, with the exception of Thelma, who's going to represent uh, Cal State Northridge, but all of our panelists represent companies that are in the top 10 of companies that our students say they're interested in. So I think kind of looping back to your question, the big change has been the interest in the digital and the entertainment and the intersection of digital media and entertainment. Great. Hello, I am Talia Williams. I am an Annenberg graduate, yay. Um, and I have moved to Netflix about four months ago. I did the first dozen years of my career as a news producer, as many of you or some of you might go on to do, and then switched into recruiting when I was over at CNN. So I spent the last three years of my recruiting career at CNN, and for me, it was obviously a career shift and a really interesting perspective on what was always the other side of the table for me and something that I think I've noticed and learned in my four years of talent is that there's a lot more purposeful approach to how we think about the makeup of our workplace. I think that's something that has a lot of work to be done, but at the same time, we're having conversations in workplaces that we wouldn't have had before. And there's also an expectation around the level of performance. You guys are part of the problem. You come out too educated and too capable. And so the way we approach folks coming out of school has really changed dramatically because the skills that everybody come with just seem to magnify dramatically every year. And that's a good thing, but it's just a, a change for the workplace. Well, hi, I'm Thelma Vickroy, and my professional background is in the world of documentary. I started in New York. I was uh, a graduate of NYU. I'm sorry, USC, but <laughs> you know, that's where I uh, went to. And um, I'm the chair of the department at Cal State uh, Northridge, and we have a pretty active film and television department and a journalism department. Um, and I have, for the past four years before this, uh, run the internship program. And part of my job was to drag the internship program into today's world and to have students look at their role in working a little bit differently. And part of that is not always being pegged at a skill set that they had, um, but to actually think about the softer skills that they might ha have uh, to bring to the table. And, um, and also to look outside of uh, not only the Netflix, the Hulus, the AOLs, and the Amazons, but there are a lot of different companies in Los Angeles that are um, doing media work that have employment. And that part of that is finding that. And, the second phase of that is to actually educate my own faculty on the changing environment and the changing world and um, to know that you have to multitask. 
So one of my frustrations, and I don't know if it happens here at USC, <laughs> but when a uh, professor gives a student a piece of paper instead of uh, something via digital platform, it to me talks very negatively towards their ability to actually navigate the world in which you all live. And I think that the education has to change at the rapid rate that the world has changed. And that's what we're trying to do. So. Hi, guys. I'm Tori anderson Shopi. Um, I'm in charge of the front page team on the West Coast for AOL.com, uh, Annenberg grad as well. I didn't have this amazing facility when I was here. So it's really, really amazing to see the newsroom, the multi multimedia center. Um, and I think that really speaks to one of the biggest changes that I've seen, at least in my career. Um, one of the biggest things is, you know, if you're, a lot of times in the past, you went to journalism school, you learned very, very well how to write a story, how to craft a story, how to write that profile, how to hone your skills in terms of storytelling. And when you get into the digital realm, you have to be able to adapt that everywhere, all different ways. You have to be able to understand your audience. It's not just you telling someone's story. It's you're telling a story for a reason. You're trying to get something across to your audience, and you have to gauge how much they're going to be interested in it and like how, what impact it has on them. And, uh, and being able to use metrics and analytics and work with product and be able to work with engineers to innovate new ways to reach new audiences, those are all kind of a really well rounded skill set that you need to have that goes beyond just the craft of storytelling. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Tannenbaum. I currently work at Hulu. I'm a manager on the AdOps, um, the AdOps team, and I run West Coast Campaign Management. Lots of great things said already, but um, I think one of the things I'll riff off of is adaptation and how quickly things are changing and how quickly we need to learn new tools and meet new people and just everything's growing. We're moving it crazy breakneck speed and to keep up with all of that is um, I think a big challenge but also a, a good change and one that's exciting to be in. Fantastic. Well, I wanted everyone to open, but I was also curious if we would get very positive, very negative, or somewhere in the middle. Um, and part of what I've enjoyed in our discussion with Working Nation is we've come at this because there's a concern. There's the idea that there may be a disconnect. And I appreciate Thelma in a note that we talked about earlier had a great phrase about referencing, encouraging students to look at their skill set, not necessarily just the job title. And I'm reminded of a few years ago, we had a conversation with students and they said, why do you teach all of these radio classes? Who listens to radio? And this past fall, I listened to a conversation that said, which of the many schools at USC could engage in an arms race to teach more podcasting classes faster? Because suddenly, audio content is the new big thing. So my question for the panelists, and maybe we can start and come back the other way, is what are the gaps and the disconnects you see between when people think about job classifications or job titles versus the skills they need, and maybe especially for the faculty and employing perspective to prospective students, maybe how do we close that gap a little bit? Um, we were kind of talking about this beforehand, but um, I think one thing that a lot of students focus on are their hard skills. So what tools do they know? What products do they know? Do they know how to use Excel? Do they know how to use PowerPoint? But I think it's really equally, if not more important, to focus on the soft skills. So how do you get along with others? Um, are you able to problem solve? Some of those are a little bit tougher to learn, and when you come out of the gate with those skills, you're going to have a huge competitive advantage. I'm going to have a much easier time finding a class to teach you how to use Excel or helping find someone to, to teach you that skill set. But I think focusing on the soft skills and your emotional intelligence would be a big thing that I, I think would be important to focus on. Yeah, I'll add to that. Uh, when I'm doing interviews for anyone on my team, I try and ask a lot of situational questions to try and get at some of those. How do you handle these types of situations when you're thrown something, an assignment, a data set, um, a story assignment, something like that, and you're, it's, it's out of your realm of what you know or what you comfortably know and how do you deal with that and being able to speak up and find a network with people within the company to figure out what you don't know and how you can learn it and do it in a way that's self-starting. That's a really key skill to have. And it's, that's one of those skills that's hard to, hard to find and hard to suss out when you're, when you're interviewing people. So that's a top one, I would say. Um, I, I still continue to self-educate. And so, you know, I will tell you the last two years I've been 
to the National Association of Television Producers and Executives, which is in Miami, and it's tiny. I've seen probably all their bosses there. <laughs> and, um, and also to CES, which is the Consumer Electronics Show. And part of that was to actually learn about what the professionals want to hear from students. And I think that that's really important. And the things I came back with, as I'm sure you have a phenomenal career center, so I'm talking to the choir here, but you know, your resume, not longer than a page, you know, um, making sure you prioritize that. Also your cover letter. Uh, I had students sending out 100 resumes in the same cover letter to each job. And they actually have to be, you know, um, um, written for each particular internship or job that they're looking for because the uh, employers want to see that there's actually something there, that it's not just a mass, you know, send out, out to that. And this is one of the things that Megan and I were talking about. I said, tell them to do research on the company and know who you're getting interviewed by and knowing something about that. So if I was going to go and get interviewed by Megan, I would actually do some research on her and find out a lot about her. Find out something that I like about what she's worked on or something that maybe you had produced in the past that I found really fascinating. Because in an interview, you just gotta get past that rote you know, answer. And I think those skills are, you know, you, you prepare in this way that you think they're gonna ask you all about this professional stuff. And it really is, can you fit in the team? Do you have the skill sets to, the emotional skill sets and the, and the interpersonal skill sets to actually um, do the job? And then secondly, are you eager? Do you have grit? Do you keep at it? I mean, those are the things that, um, you know, executives have really shared with me that I've shared with students. I think about you guys a lot, actually, because um, I try to put myself back in this position in 2003, and everything was actually quite literally simpler. It was local or network. I mean, if, I was, if you're in Annenberg, that was your choices. I started at KCRA work, weekend, weekend overnights. Had it been now, when you guys have the full complement of podcasts and digital and linear and traditional and Hulu and every option and every tool in your toolkit, one thing that I find now on this side, on the talent side, and talking to people all day, every day, is in the moment, the simplicity. Knowing that you know a lot, knowing that you could probably fit in a lot of places, are, that's great, but that's like your secret superpower. What is happening right in front of you at that moment is what's most important, because when you're having the conversation, they need you to fill their need, right? So you need to think about all of those tools that you have and every skill you have, what's relevant right now, and then infuse it with the soft skills because that's the part that can't be taught. And that's, I think, the most, that's where I see people get tripped up because you wanna show up as I can do it all and you can. Everybody can probably <coughs> hopefully achieve almost anything they want to do, but what you need is in that moment, someone to give you a chance at the opportunity that they're talking to you about. And so that clarity in the moment, and then the next day you can have a different conversation about different skills. Just who you're talking to, know your audience. Yeah, I, I think that's spot on. We talk a lot about uh, framing it as how can you be the solution to whoever you're talking to and, and really being authentic. Great. Well, the group is still saying positive, so I'm going to continue to nudge because we've organized, and this is the, the idea of saying that a lot has changed recently, and we were having some planning discussions and can looking back and saying, I'm fairly confident to call myself middle-aged to a degree and say, but in 1992, the question of how many internships would a student do would have had a very different answer than today, and what would be the composition of those internships. So one of the things I want to think about is, and several of you have different experiences in different ways, we know what some of the things have changed in a way to be different. You all have talked about different sets of skills, different employers. Are there things that we're losing in that transition? And I think about the student that I saw last year who said, I've just finished my seventh internship, and I don't know what I want to do. And my thought was, well, sleep, I hope, at some point. But uh, the, the, so this question of in, in a world where the moment you step foot on campus, the concern about your career is already predetermined, that it's something you should be worrying about, and you're thinking about all the skills, are there things that we need to be kind of be mindful of in that process? I see your, yeah. Um, I have so many ideas on this. I hope I can wrap this up ne neatly. Um, 
I think I was talking with my coworker before I came here, and you know, I think a, a lot of us, as we're going through high school and college, we're used to thinking about our lives in four-year increments, and your career is maybe a 40, 50-year increment, and so you don't have to have it all figured out when you're 22 or when you're in college. Like, there's plenty of time, and when I look at where I am right now, I would have never thought that I would be in this job or kind of gone this career path. And I took a lot of lateral moves and I took some steps back and um, I've really been all over the place, but you know, I ended up where I am and everything's fine about where, where I am right now. And so you know, I don't think you have to have it all figured out, just like find something you like doing, find something that motivates you, where you make a good living and you feel like you're contributing to the, the greater good of the world. Um, but there's literally plenty of time to figure it out. Can I piggyback on that because yeah. When I think about not knowing, I never thought I'd be a recruiter. I, I don't know what I thought I'd be, but I, I knew I was going up a news path and a track and a newsroom. Um, so yeah, surprise happens. But um, I think part of the journey is a little bit of discontent. And I think that we can get better as we're coming out of school at a little bit of discontent and a little bit of patience. And I'm, I was impatient. I mean, I wouldn't be where I was if I wasn't impatient. You have to have a curiosity and a drive if you have goals around your career. But I also worked way too many years in the middle of the night in a newsroom, and I moved to cities I didn't necessarily want to live in. And, um, and I just had to trust that things were going to unveil as long as I stayed being great at what I was doing and making sure that I was putting myself in a position to be successful in the moment. And so I, I would say the discontent is kind of part of the experience, and it's okay. Yeah, I want to add to that because I want to disagree. <laughs> I want you to have oh, fun. No, I, I mean, and this is what you wanted. I was just at a birthday party of one of my instructors who has actually um, worked at KTLA and for a long time, for like 40 years. And he teaches for us. And um, he also works at E. And there's some people that were there at that party that started when E started, which was, it wasn't called that. And one of the things we talked about is the joy of actually doing, you know, a news program or the fun they actually have, because it is a lot of fun. And I think that life is a journey. I mean, I'm probably the oldest one on this panel. And I could just say I've had fun. There's been times I've been unhappy, and there's times that I'm um, ambitious. But I don't call it disconnect. I call it ambition. And I want to be somewhere else. But I also think you need to relax and have fun um, and enjoy it because, you know, you'll never be that first, that first career again, like your very first job. You'll never have it again. Like it's that one experience and it's actually a lot of fun, I find. I'm going to jump in and oversimplify this into one simple word that I think can answer this question and that's passion. And so I think that's the number one thing and it's really, I. I've been there, I understand it. It's hard to know sometimes as a college student what you're passionate about. And so I think uh, doing a lot of internships helps, uh, but finding what you're passionate about will help you get through the tough times. It'll help you get through the amazing times. It'll help you innovate and your passions can change. You can change from getting passionate about one area of journalism and then finding yourself being in the recruiting side of it, but it's finding where your passion takes you. And that, for me, as a hiring manager, as uh, an employee myself, that's what I look to do. I, I need to check in and make sure I'm doing what I'm passionate about. And people that I hire, I want to see passion in them because that's going to be the thing that really makes them stand out. Well, I may want to, unless you wanted to. Um, the discontent, one of the interesting questions we had talking to Working Nation is we wanted involvement and we're so appreciative that you could be here to lend a multiple university perspective in Southern California. But we also realized that one of the expectations that a lot of us come to is, well, this is an entertainment and a media city. This is an entertainment and a media region. And the notion of discontent, I want to play with the idea, we're used to hearing about bubbles in the information we consume. But from the work I've done alongside Suzanne, one of the bubbles we experience is geographic. So how many folks are from Southern California in the room? How many folks want to work in Southern California? And that second part is part of the dynamic. People come here, and I wrote the same reference. There's a whole series of us New Jersey refugees that are here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, this same acknowledgement. So the question I want to ask about, and, and everyone I think has done a really nice job of starting to think about the quality of the experience. 
and to the reference that years ago in media, the notion of coming to Los Angeles was really somewhat without equal. And I'm curious, so given that you all see education and companies in different senses, how would you encourage folks to think about the challenge and the opportunity of geography in this setting? What are the opportunities and the advantages to being here? What are the, yeah, the opportunities or the challenges, perhaps, of not being on this dynamic where so many folks are coming to here, especially for that first experience? Well, shout out to Willow and your school and Maymester. I mean, you guys are literally leading the way in thinking about getting out of the L.A. bubble. Um, and so everyone who is not from L.A., they should want to be here because they are bringing a different perspective. People who are from L.A. should try and find other perspectives. It's all about collecting experiences that will make you, um, you know, more relevant and more interesting. And I want to speak to the discontent piece because I love that that word's kind of been picked up on. Discontent. I, I'm thrilled. I couldn't be more blessed with this career. I was happy always. But discontent is that little bit, I think maybe synonymous with that restlessness, right? And that um, passion and all of that. If it doesn't feel right, that's when you start to have whatever word you want to use that gives you a little bit of the wiggles. And that's when you can start to navigate and, and use that to propel you into whatever is next. Um, but it's not a general unhappiness. That is the number one sign you should get out of something if you are overly unhappy with something. I'll speak to the geography part. I have an interesting situation where I, I, my team is the only part of our editorial team on the West Coast. Everyone else on our editorial team is based in New York. So you see a lot of this with uh, digital media companies. It's, it's bi-coastal. It's heavily centered in New York. And then usually some outposts and stuff in LA. And it's a little bit opposite for the entertainment industry, obviously, because entertainment itself is centered here. And there's a lot in New York as well. Um, so I think it, one thing to keep in mind is you need to be open to all opportunities and, and look at LA from a, like a news perspective is where I'm coming from from this. Um, coming from LA, you have a special perspective from a West Coast point of view that isn't always known or shared on the East Coast. And you can kind of be representative of that and use that to your advantage if you're looking for a job. That's a piece that you can bring with you and vice versa. If you're not from the LA area, maybe you do bring exactly like we were saying before that perspective from somewhere else um, to the LA area, to the West Coast. Well, I'll talk about the entertainment part of that. Um, and not so much journalism, because I think that that's a, you almost have to split that off. Because LA is the media center. I mean, if you're interested in, you know, narrative, documentary, fiction, nonfiction, it is it is the, the hub of that. Um, but I also see it as an international um, market and that, and that it's, you don't only think of it in terms of Los Angeles, but you think of it in terms of the world. So we have a lot of international students, as I'm sure you also do. So, you know, you look at those media centers in, um, you know, Mexico, Central America, South America that are blooming, you know, and certainly in India and China. And there's so many different markets outside of just Los Angeles that if you have skill sets in a different language or a different culture, it's actually a way to, to you know, utilize those, even here in Los Angeles. And I talk a lot to students about that um, because that, you know, the biggest, certainly in the entertainment business, the biggest market is not a, um, a market in the United States anymore. It's an international market. So those skills really help. Yeah, I think you need to do Maymesters around the world. Um, no, but that's a really good point, and that's a lot of the attraction I had to a place like Netflix or a Hulu, where we have to think about our strategy. So if you flip to the streaming side or the digital side, uh, our opportunities are not in the U.S. Everybody's opportunity is around the world if you just look at sheer numbers alone. And so where are we going to grow? Around the world. We're not constrained um, in the way a lot of more traditional companies are, or we haven't grown in the way a lot of traditional companies have, both entertainment and news organizations. And so you guys are, it's just as fair game for you to consider jobs in Dubai and Singapore and London as it is anyone who from those countries trying to come here. So don't limit yourself to the US too. I mean, I hope I get sent to Amsterdam someday soon. You know, like that's part of the attraction right now. There's just so much happening, and we are all, um, I'm seeing teams 
built in a way that I've never seen before. It used to be domestic does domestic, international does international, never the two shall meet. Now it's managers in Atlanta managing people in Tokyo and managers in New York managing LA and London. And, and those teams are one team, but everybody's around the world. And so you're integrated in a really, really special way. So, and you have that moment right now that has not happened before. Yeah, our company has a goal of getting 2 billion users. We're, we don't have 2 billion people in the US. That's going to come from global growth. Excellent. Well, I appreciate the reference. And one of the things I wanted to do was thank one of the people that's made our entire emphasis on career development and thinking about the future in media, such an emphasis and a priority for the school. And we're happy to have, based on the scheduling, had her availability because she's just back from Tokyo. So I just wanted to briefly recognize and give her a chance to say hello, the Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, Will Obey. Hi, everybody. I got spotted sitting in the corner over here. Thank you all for um, joining us tonight and for being part of this conversation. Um, and thank you for giving so many shout outs to the Maymester program for getting us outside of our bubbles. It's been one of the joys of being at Annenberg to get to work with Gordon and Suzanne and their teams um, at helping you all um, make your way from it was nicely called a bubble. This is one heck of a gorgeous bubble that you all have here. Um, but from the world of school to the world of work. And what is also, I would say, um, one of the great joys is um, it's really a shared journey and it's a collaborative journey. And I know when you talk about going out into the industry to learn more about the industry, it's something we all do continuously as part of our jobs, whether our jobs are career services and student services or faculty or um, or students. Um, is there any anything you want me to hit on? No, I mean, I, mean, I think the only part we're seeing this in reference is the idea of bracketing the notion of the workforce and the university. And I think that one of the things that you've wanted to do is your leadership is say, a modern university can't accept the idea that maybe we'll think about the careers of our students. And so just maybe anything about, wait, now that you've been dean for all of two months, uh, what are you starting to prioritize or think about why this is an important way that we approach the school? Well, you know, as, as my team knows, one of the things that I've been talking about is new connections and new partnerships and new conversations and new foundations of scholarship. And I think they're all completely intertwined and not in their separate, um, in their separate silos. And one of the things that's been exciting is when we think about um, sort of what we call our industries of practice, it's very much a dialogue, and it's not a transactional relationship. Um, as much as I will call up somebody and say, you got to hire him or her or them, um, and I do that with great joy and pride, and I can do it for all of you um, without being called a helicopter parent, as I would be if I did that for my own child. Um, but it, it is a shared relationship that we have with these industries who increasingly look to us, to a school like Annenberg, for its extraordinary pipeline of talent. Talent that is um, academically uh, adept, that is technologically fluent, that is diverse in all ways, and understanding that these um, borders and boundaries that used to be clearly defined are now porous in a way that is really exciting and I think enriches your education um, here at the school. Um, but I also think um, enriches the professions by having constant dialogue and constant engagement with not just the academy, but with this generation of um, young people, future professionals um, who Oh, by the way, also happen to be your audience and your consumers and people who engage with your content or, or your products. So it's very much the way of the world where boundaries are eroding and, and becoming very much um, porous and, and transparent that that's how we are thinking about the transition from the academy to the world of work, thanks to the hard work of this team. Excellent. I would say this on USC's campus, on Columbia University's campus, on any campus, I, I am gonna brag on you guys, but you are better prepared than the majority of students that I talk to. Um, 
I spent the last three years at CNN talking to, I mean, we had tons of entry level points, tons of entry points into this industry, you know, long form, short, all of it. And I talked to a lot of students and you guys are set up in a really, really unique way and you really truly are um, standouts. So just remember that. Well, I um, work with a different student body and I work with, um, a, a group of students that may have not had had uh, as much experience um, with their families in the world. And so uh, we have a lot of classes that we actually teach at the um, different I entertainment I industry partnerships. So we actually have a, a, um, a class at Amazon. We actually have a, a class at CBS Radford, a class at Warner Brothers, and, um, and uh, we have professionals come in and teach the classes. And certainly in our um, entertainment media management area, and they primarily start about four or in the evening, so that they can come in and teach. And it does provide that absolute connection. But also on the other side, these people are teaching because they want to understand who you are and who your generation is, because it is dependent upon them to to understand that. And long ago, when I used to have students be hired by MTV, I would say, be careful with what you share, because your ideal will be stolen in two seconds. And, um, you know, it is, they, they really rely upon having a, uh, an understanding, because you have a lot of things to offer. You, if you certainly understand your own generation, or your two generations, if you're Gen Z or millennials, and how that interfaces with the media that they're actually consuming and what they're interested in. And you have a lot to sell there. And I think that that's really beneficial. Excellent. Well, thanks everyone. And I want to thank Dean Bay and the panelists for a fantastic conversation. We have a next piece of this. And so I'm going to uh, thank our panelists. And then what we're going to do is Part of the new conversations that Dean Bay referenced is that over the course of the spring, we began talking with Working Nation, and they were curious of what we were doing in this career development space. So they turned their production abilities, which are a lot of journalists that now have interesting titles like our next guest, um, Melissa Panzer, who's the executive producer of video content. So we're gonna switch panels real quick, or we're gonna show everyone a quick video to see what this new conversation. But thank our panel for a fantastic conversation. I'm scared out of my mind for the job market. I think I've applied to at least 100 jobs in the last three months. I would probably say I got an interview for maybe eight to 10 of them. I'm really interested in content for social media because that's where I watch stuff, that's where everyone my age watches stuff, and that's where the future of journalism is. My name is Eli Goodstein, and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Once I knew that I wanted to go to journalism school, I searched for the best ones in the country. Annenberg was definitely my first choice. My parents were always supportive of me studying communications. I think they knew after high school that I wanted to study journalism. I wasn't sure if money was going to be a problem in going here, and I think my parents have always been supportive of what I do. enough to receive a donation from a family to create Annenberg Works. That allowed us to expand the programs that we have to help students as they transition from school to the workplace. love it here is because they treat us like we're working at a real news organization. As media is changing so dynamically, one of the things we particularly saw is that students wanted to work more in tech and digital media. We were then able to say, okay, who do we have relationships with at these companies? We had both Facebook and Apple come to campus to recruit this spring, which is the first time ever. Our world that we were growing up doesn't look like theirs more homes now have Amazon Prime than a landline. So we have to be responsible to be building curriculum and helping students prepare for careers that are evolving so fast. What are the ways to train not only for the jobs that are available today, but the jobs that you're going to be doing in 5 and 10 or 15 years? I don't currently have a job lined up after graduation, but I'm working on it. 
When you ask employers what the number one thing they're looking for, and the number one thing is not what school you went to, what your GPA is, it's the internship experience you have. My second internship was definitely my dream internship. I got uh, to work in the video news department at CNN in New York City. Pitching stories, editing videos. I got to see people that I see on TV every day, and each internship that I've had has prepared me in some way for what is out there in the real world. I think every university, whether it's a liberal arts university, whether it's a professional school, they have a moral responsibility to care about what students do after they graduate. We are so proactive in that they, they cannot get out of USC without having been hit over the head that your career is important. It's time to start thinking about your career. Have you done an internship? So we don't let students fall through the cracks. I think our Annenberg Works program really does help students get placed in that first job that's going to kickstart their career. That's, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate you uh, letting me know that. He offered me a job. <laughs> this has been a long time coming. I've been applying to jobs for months, so it's definitely really cool. I think the last four years at Annenberg have definitely paid off. I think that it's prepared me for everything that I, I want to do. And like I know that I can take a job where I'm qualified for it and do it and do it well. And then that can just be a stepping stone to the next thing. Stone to the next thing. showcased on CBS 6 this morning. The show was going to commercial break. In fact, they thought they were in commercial. This is producer Eli Goodstein. Uh, he thought he was in the clear, apparently, and so did Rob Cardwell. They were dancing to Nelly's country grammar. Get down right there. They like to do that. They, they like to play cool music going into the commercial breaks in, in the morning, and then they just reel you in, and when you start boogieing, they, they pop pull you back up. Out. And if you know Eli, he's very quiet, and that is not something he no, would have done he, on purpose. He's a, he's a dancer, so he <laughs> likes to dance. So I'd like to oh, welcome Melissa, who I just referenced a few minutes ago earlier, who is the person responsible for producing that video, and Suzanne, is Suzanne still? I think she wraps up over. But so Melissa, have a seat real quick, and we were talking earlier, you can kind of empathize with this in a number of different ways. As a journalist and worked at some big sports company over here, yes. ESP something, yes, uh, ESPN. Uh, but this telling the story, and I, and I love what Dean Bay said about new conversations and new versions. The work that you do th telling these kinds of stories, what have you seen are the challenges and the opportunities to tell and translate these kinds of stories about the skills in the workforce gap? Yeah, so um, I think so I've worked for Working Nation since the beginning with a couple of the folks in the back of the room, uh, which is just over two and a half years at this point. And when Working Nation started, it was really important to get the message out about the problem. There's a problem with jobs. That was the thing I walked away from my first meeting with our primary investor knowing. And over the, the course of this political climate, amongst other things, the problem has become a major part of the media conversation, but what's missing over and over again is these solution programs that are really actively trying to fix the problem. And they go from community to community. I mean, the thing you were talking about earlier, we're in LA, media is a big part of the LA climate. That's obviously not true everywhere. You know, manufacturing is a big part of the middle of the country. And so we tell these stories that are highly specific to the community that they're based in, showing there are super innovative ways to solve this problem. And it's really important as a student, as an employee, as an employer, as a recruiter, to be paying attention to the folks that are working to fix it. And oftentimes it comes from a collaborative effort between you know, the community, a financier, and a training program like USC. And so, um, for us, every program that we talk about in one of these short films is, has figured out a way to solve this problem in their small community. Um, and this program is no different. 
Excellent. Well, Suzanne, this is kind of a best case scenario story. And I know I'm sure some folks in the room are wondering this is new USC propaganda. I do want to reference this is Working Nations production, the editorial control, this is a real story. But I want to go back. Suzanne's been doing career work for a number of years here. And the idea a few years ago of saying, when family came in and looked at us and said, how do you change the way you approach the relationship of students to work? That it, there's lots of different choices and none of them reasons. So I want you to kind of just, for folks that are now seeing the end of this transition or the end of the beginning of this story, what's different about the way Annenberg works requires us to think about career development? Well, I think what's, you know, what tonight is about the celebration of our school and the work that we as a school do collectively and why I think it's such a wonderful advantage that you're all here and thinking about this and participating is it's embedded in the DNA of Annenberg. You know, Annenberg works originally started as a slogan in our office when we had, we had a donor gift three years ago, but it has become, and certainly with Dean Bay's leadership, it is in, embedded in everything we do. I'm sure several of you have classes where there are industry speakers, there are case studies that you are, you know, there are, I know we have several faculty who bring in uh, potential employers in the beginning of the semester and they'll work on a project uh, and then you may go to their place of employment and actually present to executives. So, and then of course, you saw the video, Eli, and the media center and the training you get there. So I, I think it's a huge advantage here at Annenberg that it's embedded in everything we live and breathe in faculty and staff. So what was, from someone coming in and seeing this, what was the kind of most significant or striking thing for you about finding the research that led to the story? Because I, mean, I know Eli was one of a number of students that was identified, but what kind of led you in that direction to tell this story? Yeah, so <clears throat> two things. One, I think we, when we, we tell a variety of stories, and um, I think something that was important about this one was to a point you were just making, uh, it's really important that the end goal for students is a job. And there's a lot of four-year universities that that isn't the end goal for. And so that, that was really important in finding a program that that was what mattered, that you leave here and you have a job or good prospects of a job. And so for Eli, I mean, outside of being just totally charismatic and just like a great personality, he didn't have a job when we started this process. And so he was terrified. I mean, that wasn't a joke. Nothing about that was coached. He was really scared about not having a job. And it was like six weeks away from graduation when we did that. And, to, and so we wanted a student who we were confident that would get a job, but that we could watch them go through that experience because the emotional complexity of what you feel when you graduate from school is really important. And we felt like we needed that in the story. Fantastic. Well, I think, and if I'm right, that we have a special guest that we're going to be able to loop in. Hi. Hi. Oh, we can't hear him, though. Oh, you can't hear me? Oh, now we can. So we I now? want to okay. thank you for making time. Uh, we understand that you're on a slightly different sleep schedule with your job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> folks just saw the video, which admittedly did include you dancing on air, that that was made sure to be included. But, uh, Thanks to your dad. He posted that on Facebook. That's how we found it. What, yeah. <laughs> you've got a crowd of uh, a lot of current students and folks from the university community. What would you tell them about your experience of going, of going through that from career and internship to now, and then right after graduation being on the working side? What, what have you kind of thought about or reflected from that transition? Um, just pushing through, I think, uh, during the job process. I mean, you saw a little bit of it in the video. And I think that the biggest thing is just not um, not really having a full, it's OK to not have a full idea of what the working world is going to be like and what uh, the job market is going to look like and what the process is going to be like to actually find a job. Um, it For me, you know, when you're graduating you you don't have a you don't have a job foundation already so you're you're trying to find that first job and i think that for me it was just sort of trying to dip my toe in as many different areas as i could because i because of my experience in the media center i i had um i kind of had the best of both worlds so i, I worked on the um, broadcast side and i you know made videos for social media and I feel like my experience definitely allowed me to apply to as many jobs as I could um, and for me it was it was it was difficult because I, I felt like I needed to make 
a choice. I felt like I needed to decide between one area or the other area. And that was, uh, that was really, it was tough for me. Um, but with the job that I have now, I think that I sort of found that best of both worlds and um, I'm definitely happy with what I'm doing right now. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. And, and we were just talking before about, and you said that you don't have a plan, you don't have a particular path. Can you talk a little bit about not only what you're doing, but where you're doing it? Because weird, you grew up in Atlanta, you obviously spent time out here, but you've got a, a new surrounding to be working with. So just tell us a little bit about where and what you're up to. So I work as a morning newscast producer at the CBS station in Richmond, Virginia. And, uh, you know, it's an incredible job, mainly because I don't just work as a morning newscast producer. They have given me plenty of opportunities to produce social videos for them, um, which is sort of like an untapped area of local news. And I think it's, um, it's just an incredible opportunity that they've given me. Um, and, you know, the, Richmond is a, it's a medium-sized market in the U.S. And getting, getting a producer job straight out of school that is in that market size is, uh, to, to me, even when they offered me the job, I was like, oh, my God, this is crazy. <laughs> you know, this is something that I couldn't even imagine, you know, because a lot of us who want to be producers or reporters, we want to, you know, we want to be in a top 100 market because, you know, this is USC Annenberg and, and we want to, you know, we strive for the best. We're, we're ambitious, you know, it's one of our, our five traits. So I think that that sort of, that sort of caters to um, my, my thought process when I first heard about the job opportunity. You, I feel like it's important to mention too that it's where you wanted to be. This was a job that you got that you were excited and wanted to go take. Yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, when I looked at, all the offers that I got, um, I think that this one was the one that felt the most right. Um, cause there, there were a lot of jobs out there that, you know, there is, you know, there, there was one job in particular that I, you know, got offered an internship that could potentially turn into a job. Um, and with this one, I knew right away, just based on my conversations with people, um, I had, I had three different Skype conversations with the anchors at the station with the executive producer with the news director and you know what i loved about them was that they were genuine people that they they work really hard they love what they do and they wanted to give me a chance and that that was a huge deal for me for someone you know who just graduated it's it's uh it's great to get that sort of opportunity to do that Fantastic. Well, before we let you go, and we're very appreciative, you caught the timeline, and he's on the East Coast doing morning production, so like everyone in here is ready six months after graduation to start getting up at what time in the morning? Uh, 11 p.m. Well, I, yeah, yeah you started. I, I, so I go into work at uh, 11 p.m., and I work until 7 a.m., because, you know, as a morning newscast producer, you, you got to go in late, and you got to got to put in the hours before uh, you do a show at 5 and 6 a.m. So before we let you go, uh, the big question to ask is, you've got a, a room full of folks that are curious, what last bit of advice or thoughts, if you were talking to yourself a year ago in this room from someone that just graduated, is there any bit of advice or any bit of wisdom that you would want to pass on? Um, Suzanne is my favorite person ever. <laughs> and uh, Why? definitely, <laughs> well, I think that the, you know, one thing that I really wanted to say was that the career development program at Annenberg is unreal because um, I got amazing opportunities, um, not only through working in the media center, but, you know, working with Suzanne, I got the opportunity to go on the Maymaster trip, which allowed me to network with people um, who could be potential employers. And I got to go on the first trip to the South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas, which was another opportunity to do that. And on top of that, you know, Suzanne really, um, you know, I would, I would try to make appointments in her office and whenever I came in, she was always there to, you know, set up a conversation with someone who was working in an area of the journalism field that I was interested in. And, you know, that, that just made it easier for me because she was sort of, she was that in between for me to find people who were interested in someone like me to work for them. And I think that, you know, Suzanne, she's, she's just awesome. I don't know how, I don't know what else to say. Um, but yeah, she, she's definitely, you know, I think 
everyone needs to utilize the um sorry hold on one sec i think my mom is calling me <laughs> <laughs> live tv all right um i'll call her back but uh <laughs> sorry about that um but yeah i think that my biggest piece of advice is to use the career development program you know that's how i also you know found out that i think you know work as hard as you can and reach out to the people who are the people who can help you the most um, and you know find ways especially you know with college being something that is uh, you know getting getting more and more expensive you know looking for scholarship opportunities looking for uh, things like that in Annenberg because uh, you know I you know eventually I, I found those opportunities to uh, you know apply for scholarships and get scholarships based on the skills um, that I learned in the media center and I think that you know the scholarships plus Suzanne equals success <laughs> awesome well we're really appreciative of your time congratulations again and thank you for making the time today thanks thank you thanks Eli thank you so much thank you Uh, the sign of a great program with great participants and content is that you hear lots of interesting perspectives and we actually stay on schedule, so we have a few minutes for questions before the reception starts. So I know we've got a couple of different microphones that we can walk around. Um, please just raise your hand and we're happy to... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Come back. Yes. Yeah, please. I knew folks were being interviewed and on TV and we had all kinds of stuff going on, so you stay. Here, I'll, I'll walk a mic around, so... Who's got questions? You've heard the cliche joke, you can't have a communication school where no one talks. Yeah, that's glib, I use it all the time. Um, I know Professor Gordon specifically mentioned a story about how he spoke with a student who, who had said that he had seven internships. And so um, I know that some of you are recruiters, and so my question is when you're looking um, to hire students, what type of internships are you looking for them to have had? Well, I'll answer from a hiring manager perspective, and it's gonna be a little bit more narrow. They can probably give you a more broad answer. So when I'm hiring someone for my team, I have a very specific role that I'm looking for them to fill. So for example, last opening I had on my team, I was looking for someone who had experience in a digital newsroom, had experience in multiple CMSs, had a sense of product side of things, could tell a story in multiple platforms, could um, work with engineers and things like that, and wasn't just doing one type of story in, on one platform in one area. There's certain, obviously there's certain jobs where that makes the most sense, but from my perspective, I had a very clear, like I, want, I need someone who has worked in the digital media sphere, covering news, has a sense of news judgment, hard news, when do we send a push alert versus when do we just put the story on the site, that sort of thing. So from, from my perspective, I had a very clear, like direct picture, but for other more entry level roles, there might, it might be broader, and I'll leave it to you guys to recruiters talk about more of that. Yeah, I, I think many, whenever there's an open role, I think it's the safe bet that that hiring manager is looking for an apples to apples comparison. So if you can show that you've done that role or had experience in a certain tool or a certain program before in a previous internship, that's gonna, that's gonna be what's gonna get you into the door. If it's an entry level position, I think there's a ton more leeway. Um, but sometimes I feel like when I'm talking to students, they think, well, their, their experience is similar enough, but really to get a job you really, the hiring manager is looking for someone who's really done that specific job before. So that would be the, the biggest thing to think about when you're, you're building your resume or thinking about where you wanna work and then going out and getting internships that are similar to where, in a, a company you'd wanna work in or a field you'd wanna be in. 
I would say a, a little bit of a common thread showing a progression through your school, you know, showing that you have identified something that is maybe a passion point or something that you show up well at, and then finding maybe it's even a repeat, in a, you know, um, internship, or it's certainly uh, not too varied. But I also really appreciated, um, and, and I say appreciated because we don't unfortunately have internships at Netflix right now, but at CNN, I really appreciated a little bit of intrigue and a little bit of diversity. I mean, some of the most interesting intern level candidates or you know entry level candidates I can think of had an internship at a startup in Africa or somewhere that was um, off script, right? And I knew that they learned things that they did not learn and anything that would have spoke to exactly what their career was because we want different perspectives, especially in the industry we're in of storytelling. And so um, there shouldn't, there should be no, not to say there's no allowance for something that's off script. And if I could just one comment that I know we've talked a number of times about with students is uh, our student interest overall is sports and entertainment, and those are nouns, and everything that you're just hearing here are verbs. In sports, what stories do you tell? What do you talk about? And I know this is the transition you made, and so one of the things that I'd highlight for folks is we not so subtly joke that sports and entertainment here are a Trojan horse. You take the class because sports are entertainment, but the skills you experience about telling those content and those stories are what these folks are talking about. So I would encourage even more of that kind of thought process. Can I just add one quick thing? Sorry. So um, this is just about me. I'm not a recruiter by any means, but I will tell you my own experience. I was a theater major at Syracuse, and my six months after being a theater major at Syracuse, I was hired by Joan Lynch, who spoke at the beginning, uh, at ESPN. I could not tell you who won the Super Bowl the year before I was hired. And, and I think it worked to my advantage for exactly the point that you were just talking about. I was passionate about learning the thing that I was there to do. And I think that was clear as a new hire, because I, I was your age. I was just graduating college. And um, I think you guys were talking about this earlier, the passion component. I think as much as you can have on a piece of paper, like great internship experience, if you are passionate about this business, that goes like a really far distance as a person that is looking for employees. My question is, what's the best part about your job or your company? I'll jump in on this, it's really timely for me. Um, I have been at Hulu, this will be seven years in November, and what I absolutely love about working at Hulu is our culture, and Halloween is referred to lovingly at Hulu as Huluween. It is a national holiday, and almost every single department dresses up in a costume together, and um, I cannot tell you what my team is doing this year because it's super top secret, but I'm in it to win it. I wrote it into my goals. It's in work day. And that's what I love most about Hulu is we're just like a super fun, awesome company. And we work really hard, but we also don't take ourselves too seriously. So wish me good luck. I'll report back um, after Thursday, October Photos. 28th. Um, I can answer that too. Uh, we get to like find these incredible stories every day. I mean, you know, right? Like. It is so fun to, to know literally nothing about something and then just get into the weeds of it and find out every possible thing you can about that thing. I, start, I mean, I make a lot of documentary style stuff and it's just like amazing what you get to learn even if you don't think you're gonna be interested in it. I mean, going into a, thing, a situation with an open mind and thinking, what can I learn about this that I didn't know before? It's amazing. You're so lucky to be able to do that. I don't know what Netflix does for Halloween because I have not been there yet, <laughs> but I am intrigued by yours. Um, we have free lunch, so I do like that. I, however, more importantly, love most that I did not know I was going to be here. And so just remember that 12 years ago, whatever it was, more than that. But when I made the shift to 12 years, I did not know I was going to be in this seat. I didn't know I was going to be in this career. I didn't know I'd be at this company. And there has to be a little bit of uncertainty that keeps you excited about whatever it is that you're going to do. You're never going to have a clear, uh, I mean, we, we just won't know what's coming for us in life in general. But that's part of the fun in our industry because um, I think it's really amazing, the work we get to do, the cultures, whether it be Hulu, Netflix, uh, Disney, anyone, every culture is really special. Um, and I think that we should relish in the fact that you're part of this industry broadly. Yeah, I'll jump on to that. Um, the thing I love about my job the most is 
one of my favorite areas of digital journalism is innovation and figuring out, basically solving problems in creative ways that all revolve around storytelling and how that takes different forms and different formats and the challenges, the new challenges that come up with that and figuring out, being the one to figure out, okay, uh, for these types of notifications, what's our strategy? What's working? What's not? How do we improve it? What types of stories are doing well? What, what can we do new and differently that is going to make us stand out and it's going to bring in a new audience? So that constant challenge and constant problem solving is one of my favorite things. Tell me deal. I, I hear teaching is uh, a job and directing teaching. a cinema and telematic arts I, program is kind of a... I love teaching. Uh, I done it for 35 years and so I love it I think there's nothing better than teaching and um, and to teach something that I love doing and and telling stories is phenomenal and I learn every single day um, I do want to share a story can I share a story yeah, um, I wanted to tell you that you should just be really open I've have amazing stories about students who um, have gone in. Uh, I'll give you my latest one. And I had a student that came in and got a, uh, an internship at NFL Films. You know, kind of an antiquated company, right? You would think, right? So, you know, she ends up getting a job and she comes to me and she says, they want me to work full time. And I'm always like, no, finish your degree. Finish your degree. You cannot go. And so we worked it out and she did it. And so she was uh, an assistant to the producer of the Super Bowl, and the producer left, and she ended up producing with another person in, that, in the same equal area, Lady Gaga's um, halftime show. And she just graduated in May. And so she did that last year in her senior year. So it's like just being open, available, and sometimes saying, yes, it's okay, I'll do it. Because that was pretty scary, I think, for her. That's fantastic. Time for one more question? Sure. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, I'm wondering what you each would say is the most crucial um, new element of storytelling, like in this digital age. I'll start because I'm the one who's not a storyteller currently in the most, um, I guess, overt sense. But mine is not a new skill, it's an old one. Writing, yeah. writing, writing, writing. Be a great writer, be a smart writer, be a creative writer, be a, you know, any, all of that. There's no part of a story that needs to be told that doesn't need a great writer for it, whether it's writing an email or directions or the actual script. I was just gonna say, it's different but similar, not new old also i think it's really important to remember like what a good story is maybe it takes eight seconds and maybe it takes eight hours but there's a lot of hype about like how you tell a great story in eight seconds and start with someone's eyes and all this shit excuse my language but those things matter to get your audience but like you have to tell a great story in the end and that's the same today as it was a hundred years ago and know your audience I'm in an operations role, so it's process and procedure for me. So I don't think I have a lot to add to this part. So I leave it to you. Um, I think being able to pivot and still keep your task at mind and tell the story. And I think you have to pivot in today's age so fast um, that it's just something that if you have that ability, it's a really good selling tool for yourself. And the one thing I would add, and those of you that are in class with me this semester, I hope you've got, heard this, is imagination. One of the challenges that I think is that you find all of the moments in history where people describe, we thought about it the way someone described it before, and so that's the way we thought about it going forward. And at times, it's incredibly terrible. I mean, the, the, the story I always think about it is in the 9-11 Commission Report, one of the most powerful findings in the document is that the, 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 the federal government didn't feel it had thought about the idea of aircraft being repurposed. Well, you only would have to read moderately bad fan fiction or Tom Clancy books 
where he had written a book five years earlier with a plot focused on that that sold millions of copies. And so one of the questions, especially I read today about people saying dystopian fiction or optimistic fiction is look for ways that inspire your imagination because it'll unlock your way to think about a story or a subject because everything you just heard is you want to hear a different way to tell that story. If you wanted the most boring, most dry version, you probably have that available. What you're looking for is a hook or an angle or connection and that's what's going to really make compelling stories. Um, to be respectful of everyone's time, we're at time now, but I first want to thank all of our panelists, both in the first and second part of it tonight. <laughs> thank all of the folks from Working Nation for their months of cooperation and partnership for being involved with in us and producing this video tonight. Uh, our uh, facilities folks that work with all of this, and you heard earlier, Eli was sleeping and wasn't sure if he was going to make it available, so having him online. And then for everybody being here, we've got a reception that is in 106 behind us. You're all certainly welcome to join us. But thank you all for having, have a great evening.